there is always something to be said about the boy who seemingly has everything. As a young man, I never paid much attention to what others had to say about me, only yearning for the attention of my parents. Friends came and went, but family was forever. And yet it seemed that my parents were always just a little too busy for me. My father was cold, the most I would ever get was a pat on the back and a muttered good job. While my mother was kinder, it was clear that when she looked at me, something was missing. Despite this, I always tried to keep a positive outlook on life, working my hardest to maintain my good grades. I was a very intelligent young man, remarkable even. I showed great academic prowess and was miles ahead of the other kids in the class, of course. They had something to say about it. But who cared? I did not need friends. I did not need to waste any time. I had one goal in life, to reach the top. So it only made sense that when I was older and graduated, I would leave my hometown of Berlin, flying to a quiet little American town nestled in a lush forest landscape. It was beautiful, but I didn't dwell on the beauty of it all. I had come here for a reason. Low property prices. Working as a surgeon in Berlin had been fine. But I did not like to work under others. I wanted to be the one who other people worked under. I wanted to be the one to make the important decisions. I wasn't power hungry, so I just had a very meticulous way of doing things. And my visions weren't often shared. When my practice finally opened up, it started off slow. But as the years turned into a decade, I had made a name for myself, Christoph Hoffman, expert surgeon. I was never one to boast, but even hearing it made me smirk a bit. I was known for my exquisite attitude, always providing top-notch care to those who came to visit me. But what was hiding underneath that chipper exterior? Nobody had ever known. Not until he came along. Arlo Flores, aspiring nurse. He was an astute young fellow pretending to just run into me at the hospital, badgering me with questions. It was sort of endearing. And before I knew it, the young college student had grown to be... close. Was that what it was? I wasn't really sure. I just knew that whenever Arlo came around, it wasn't a bad thing. It was nice to have some company around. But then the problems began. Most notably, a problem named Jackson. The man was a wreck. His life was going nowhere, despite the fact he was only 20-something. And he carried this negative energy around wherever he went. The first time I had met him, I hoped it would be the last. This is my boyfriend, Jackson. Arlo's voice was sweet as he introduced him. And I felt this strange feeling. I wanted to protect my protege from this mess of a man. A boy like this would only drag Arlo down, and the nurse's future was far too bright to throw away. That's why I was relieved to hear that they had broken up only a few weeks later. But he wasn't happy about the outcome. Arlo wasn't as peppy as he had been before, a sadness in his eyes that he couldn't seem to shake away. It tugged on the strings of my heart, something I had not used in a long time. What was this feeling? How could I make it go away? The problem needed to go away. They had made up a violator, but it went south almost instantly. It was sort of pathetic, and I needed Arlo to be the bright young man I knew him as. But when they broke up the second time, it seemed as though Arlo had disappeared entirely. It made my stomach feel hollow as I waited to hear something. I wanted him to be okay. I needed him to be okay. But then Arlo was officially declared missing. I quickly pieced everything together. And it all made sense. The problem I should have removed a long time ago. The problems that took away the one thing in this life that brought me any sort of joy. The one thing in my life that threatened to actually care about me. Gone. All because of a problem. And the problem needed to go away. It was so simple now. What did I have to lose? It felt strange to look through some of the journals and books Arlo had left behind, 
scouring them to find Jackson's contact info. But when I found it, I was quick to send him an email about meeting. He wanted to talk about Arlo, of course. Perhaps we could figure out where he went together. The thought of working with a man like him made me grin, and I waited for a response. It came quickly, and Jackson wasted no time coming over to the practice that night. A quiet knock could be heard at the front door as I approached, pulling it open as I eyed the man. I spoke to him calmly. Hello. It's nice to see you again. You too. Jackson seemed skeptical. What did you want to talk about? He asked. Arlo left some notes behind in my study, I explained, as I began to lead the man deeper and deeper into my practice, the heavy door shutting behind him as we approached the last door in the hall. They were quite worrying. I had not read them until now, but I thought you could help me make sense of it all. Of course, Jackson did not object, and I slowly began to pull the door open. But this wasn't my study. This was an operation room. One that was set up for an operation. Before Jackson could even process what was going on, he felt a sharp jab in his shoulder. Neither myself nor Jackson were ever seen again. I'm sure it was assumed that we had something to do with Arlo's disappearance. But there was no way to really prove this. Even still, I had no family or friends. So who would they contact?